We recognize that he who watches over Israel never sleeps or slumbers, right? He calls us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we recognize that that holy land is indeed a deep connection to us as Christians, even if we've never been there. We realize how important it is to the kingdom and how important it is to the prophetic word that God has given us. And, and you know, prophecy buffs are kind of going nuts when we see all the kind of stuff that's going on. And we recognize God knows what's going on. And we don't know the timing. We don't know where we're at. But we know that certainly the nation of Israel and the nations that surround it, these are the very words of Jesus as we see these things. So I don't hear, I don't have any prophetic word from the Lord. All I know is we are called to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're called to pray for the peace of Israel, and our hearts should go out to them. And we could also recognize that uh, if you were here a number of months ago, we kind of started a series on the end times, and I mentioned that whoever keeps these statistics has told us that 2022 and 2023, and I don't think much has changed in 2024, that we are in the most militarized and war kind of environment that we've been in since, we, since World War II, okay? Meaning there's more nations engaged in more battles and skirmishes and military conflict than at any time since World War II. And so we need to be just, you know, very much aware of what's going on and we need to be very much in prayer and on our knees. So it could be, you know, our, we've prayed many times in this particular body for Israel, and we've also prayed for the war in Ukraine. And it could be with Iran getting in the mix that those conflicts start to merge. It's very, very possible. I'm not prophetic. I'm not saying it is. But be aware of what's going on. And always ask the spirit of the living God how does this relate to what you've already told us will happen? And how would you have me to pray over these situations? So I'm going to ask you, for those who are able, if you would like to stand with me for a moment. We just want to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Israel and pray over the situation there. And we'll include Ukraine and Russia and all that's going on with them as well. Heavenly Father, we just want to do as you have commanded us to do. We want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem pray for our brothers and sisters in Israel. We pray for those on both sides of the conflict, Lord God, that they would come to know you as their Savior, as the one true living God, Lord, that you will work out all things according to your plan of purpose for the goodness of your will, Lord God, to be done in these situations. Lord, I pray that no weapon formed against Israel will prosper unless it is devised and schemed by you, Lord God, to bring about repentance in their hearts, Lord. So I pray that the national people of Israel will indeed find an opportunity in their hearts to repent, to seek you, to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah, as their Lord and Savior, Lord God. And I pray for uh, all that's going on and continuing to go on in Russia and Ukraine and those other conflicts around the world, Lord God. Let them not escalate any further, Lord God, but bring peace in hearts and minds and into the situation that we see ourselves in, Lord. Teach us, Lord, to pray. Teach us to hear and receive from your spirit. That's what you would have from us, Lord God, to be an intercession for those people who we may not see the bullets flying and the rockets in the air, but we certainly can pray to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and recognize that you are in absolute authority and control and that your peace will indeed invade that land, Lord God, through whatever means you bring. So use us as people of prayer to do your will in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you so much. And back to our study here. So if you haven't been here, uh, this is your first time, welcome. Or if you haven't been here in a while or anything else, we've been going through, as I said, first off, we spent a series looking at kind of end times topics, certainly not exhaustive. We'd be here for years just talking about everything the Bible says about end times. But we tried to lay a foundation for what the end times in Scripture has to say to us in terms of how to live our lives and how to recognize what's happening in the world around us, especially as things like war and conflict begin to escalate around us. Yeah. And that transitioned us into the book of First Thessalonians, which I said is, I think, a natural flow, uh, flow through from that because every single chapter in both First, Second, First and Second Thessalonians has a reference to something about the end times, our blessed hope, the fact that Jesus Christ, we need to be prepared for Christ's return and the recognition of all these things that are going on. And so we've been in the book of First and Second Thessalonians, 
And as I told you, uh, maybe for those who are here, you know, Paul is just writing. He's not really writing a very organized and special kind of book like he is with Romans or Hebrews or even Galatians where it's this methodical, let me explain why I have the truth and you need to recognize that it is truth and accept it. Here he's talking to a church and just kind of complimenting them on their faith and he encouraging them in their faith and he wants to encourage them in a way that leads them towards an understanding of who, uh, who, what their salvation really means to them. And so we're going to take it any verses at a time as we can. Last week we took 12 verses. Today we're only going to take one verse. Okay? And for those of you who kind of know my personality, you'll realize as soon as we read it why we're only looking at one verse today. But it's super, super important. So without any further delay, let's look at that verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. Paul, writing to this church in Thessalonica, says... He's talking about, if you recall from last week, if you're, again, if you're here, he was talking about his conduct, how he is a man who is absolutely committed to the Lord, and he says before God and before men, I live without reproach, I have a clean conscience in all that I am doing. And so he says, for this reason, and he's speaking of himself, Timothy, and Silas, he says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Paul's making a really absolutely strong case that what he gave to them in teaching doctrines for the church didn't come from him. Didn't come from his mind, didn't come from his heart, didn't come from other men. It came as the truth of God. If you want an additional reference to that, you can go look at Galatians chapter 1. Paul makes the exact same kind of claim. He says, I don't teach what came from my own heart. doesn't say I don't I didn't teach what came from other people and their beliefs. I teach the word of God as it is truth. Okay. And so we need to focus on this. He's uh, telling them a number of things I think are super important. First off, we'll just cover this. Leaders are thankful for heaven-bound believers. Okay. So for those, we've covered this in Hebrews a little bit. We've covered it already here in Thessalonians. But recognize that people who are appointed by God to be in some form of church leadership, deacons and elders and ministry heads, and have anybody who's taken some kind of responsibility in the church, we really have a, at our core of our being, we should be deeply concerned that each person we minister to is heaven-bound. Okay. All the other stuff is important, but it pales in comparison to making sure that believers, that people who are attending in the church, are actually bound for heaven. Because what point does it have to make us healthy and wealthy and wise in this planet, and then you simply go, no, you go to the wrong place in the, in the destination ahead, right? heaven-bound believers. So Paul, evaluating what he hears in response to the conduct of this church, he and Silas and Timothy are giving thanks to God without ceasing that these believers are heaven-bound, that they are actually headed towards heaven because of their faith, because of their practice, because they are unwavering in the way that they are living out their Christian walk. So the gratitude that's expressed here was for those who walk worthy of God in genuine obedience to him. That's one of the ways that Paul, like a human being he is, like you and I, he can't tell who's heaven bound because he can't see the heart. But he can see the way they're walking out their faith. He can see their conduct and he's great, greatly thankful that their conduct is representing the kind of conduct that shows that they are true and genuine believers. So he's, they're thankful that their teaching had effect. I don't know if this, the history of this makes enough sense to us, but Paul went to Thessalonica a few, you know, maybe a year or so earlier, and there wasn't a single Christian there, which means there wasn't a single heaven-bound person there. And he goes and he preaches the word, and certainly he, under, he endures affliction and persecution against his message, but he looks back and he says, these people... Who, however many the count and the number is, these people are heaven-bound, and they're thankful with great gratitude that God used them 
to speak a message of truth that actually penetrated deep into the heart and allow them to walk worthy of that faith and that calling and obedience that God has put them in. So it's important we recognize that those who continue to walk in the manner worthy of God, is, you know, if it's calling on their life, those are the ones they are explicitly saying great thanks of gratitude to God for. Right? We can talk about like the four soils. Remember Jesus talks about the four soils. You've got the wayside seed and the rocky seed and the seed sown in the thorns. And every one of those groups, they get the word for a second or for a season or even for a longer period of time, but they at some point cease. But what Paul is thankful for is those who are walking in the word. They're showing their faith. They're showing their conduct. They're continuing to walk in this manner that is worthy. Okay. So I believe faith is active and it's in the present and it gains great reward. If we have faith today, that's awesome. Yesterday's faith really doesn't afford much, does it? If I had faith yesterday, but I don't have faith today, what does it purchase me? What does it promise me? What can I gain from it? Okay. And if I say, well, I don't want faith today, but maybe I'll think about faith tomorrow. Well, that's not very valuable either, is it? It's faith in the present. And of course, every moment of our lives, every day, every year, every decade of our lives is the present. So we need to have fact, active faith in the present and walk worthy of this calling. We need to be committed to Christ. He's certainly committed to you. He's committed to your, to your eternal destiny, your heaven-bound destiny. He's committed to whatever is best for you, he's committed to it. We need to be committed equally back to him as much as depends on us. Okay. But really the focus of today's message is to recognize the entirety of God's word is truth and must be believed or accepted as such by believers. I mean, we look at the Word. He's given us His Word. It has been challenged, and it has been refuted by people who don't know and don't study the Word enough to understand it and certainly don't have a heart. But I, I, there's, a, there's, a Stott, uh, uh, there's a quote from John Stott. I keep quoting. I need to get it on paper someday. But he just says, The Bible, or the Scriptures, well, I can't remember which one it is, he says, is the anvil upon which many a hammer has been shattered. Right? Because many people try to attack the Word of God. They try to attack the Word of God. They try to attack the Word of God. And they always end up with proverbial egg on their face because God's Word stands true, never needs to be modified, never needs to be changed, and every attempt to attack it always falls short and those approaches of trying to attack the Word of God always require modification. Oh, well, that didn't work. Let's try something else. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try something else. That didn't work. That, let's try something else. And we find that this Word is God's Word, and it is pure, it is perfect, and it is without error. A few verses that support that, that I encourage you to kind of pack away, tuck away, circle, highlight, wherever you put them. Like Psalm 119, verse 160. Yep, we're... 160 verses in Psalm 119. It's your favorite chapter to read, right? Psalm 119, 160. The psalmist here writes, The entirety of your word is truth. And I'm certain that comes both before he wrote these words and after, which would include the New Testament. Every word that God speaks is recorded in Scripture is truth. The entirety of God's word is truth. And every one of his righteous judgments will endure forever. Jesus himself in John 17, in praying for his disciples, says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. What does Jesus think about Scripture? Jesus says, Scripture is true. Sanctify them in this word because your word is true. Jesus is affirming Scripture. If we're calling him Lord, we ought to think like he thinks. We ought to surrender to what he says. He says God's word is true. A couple ones that may sound familiar to those who study this kind of thing. From Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture, no writing of scripture is of any private interpretation. 
for prophecy never, I'm sorry, I'm reading from Second Peter now, I realize that, sorry. I, I, know, I was like, this is, not, this, is not, this is not what follows in, uh, in First Peter. No, right. Anyway, so for Second Peter 1, verse 20, Timothy, or so, well, Peter says this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I thought I included the next verse and probably cut it out for time's sake. But anyway, uh, so you see Paul, you see Peter, you see Jesus, you see the Old Testament psalmist, all making the same declaration. God's word is true. It, was, it came not by the will of man. It came not by the heart of man. It was not here to deceive anybody. It's God's word in truth. Okay? We need to bind that on our hearts and our minds and recognize if something doesn't look right, the problem is with me, not with God's word. If something doesn't sound right, the problem is with me, not with God's word. If I don't understand something, I can't reconcile something, the problem is not with God's word, it's with me. But that's a great opportunity to let him help us resolve that by his spirit who guides us and leads us and teaches us in all truth. Right? So don't put the word of God underneath your thoughts that you think you're wiser and smarter than God and God's word. So ultimately, all truth claims must be built upon the perfect foundation of God's word. I'm saying this in a general sense. Everything, okay? I mean mathematics, and I'm talking biology, and geology, and astronomy, and chemistry, and all. Everything needs to be founded on God's word. In fact, it, it already is. Because if we talk about things, and you say two plus two equals four, why would that be the same every place you go in the universe and every time in the universe unless there actually is something reliable and predictable about the universe we live in because we live in a universe that was created by a God who references order. So all of these things need to be built on the truth of God's word, submitted to it. We can't come to any scientific or mathematical or philosophical kind of conclusions that are somehow different than God's word because it simply is automatically false by definition because God's word is true and man has to submit and surrender to it. That's a calling for every one of us. So God wor God's word stands as the supreme authority and has absolute veracity, meaning it cannot be impeached in any way. Man's word is always suspect and subject to change or correction. If I had time, I would go through just the last year's worth of headlines and pull from scientific articles a headline of a quote that says something like this. This changes everything we thought we knew about, and then fill in the blank. Happens every single week. This changes everything that we thought we knew about this. Guess what will happen next week about the same topic and next year? I mean, you don't want to go and have surgery from a surgeon who studied a book about medicine 200 years ago, do you? Not even 20. Not even 20. Maybe not even 10, right? Because it's constantly changing. It's constantly updating. It's constantly getting evolving, if you will accept that word, in terms of our understanding of the human body and how medicine affects it and all of these things. So we look at science books, whether any topic... From 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we go, well, that had to be updated because it's wrong. And guess what will happen 100 years from now? Everything that we think is so accurate today will be wrong because the scientists at least have the honesty to say, or whoever it is, the authorities in these disciplines, will have the, have the wisdom to say, oh, my predecessors got it wrong, but I think I got it right. And they'll keep doing this over and over and over again. Okay. So God's word is un unimpeachable, and you can actually understand that its claims can be tested and verified and proven beyond all forms of reasonable doubt. Okay. So there is the foundation upon which we need to build our understanding and our faith. Okay. And having done that, if you're willing to follow me, already have hopefully, but follow me in this journey of saying, I will put God's word as the absolute authority in my life. I accept it as true. I will never understand it fully, but I am willing to say where I don't understand it, it still has something to say, and I will pray that God will give me wisdom to understand it at some point in time in my future. Okay. 
But an unwavering belief in God's word produces powerful results. I'm going to read 2 Peter verse 5 through 7 of chapter 1, or you can look at the little banner over here that we've had for a couple of years now. Okay. Peter writes this in 2 Peter, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. These things are cumulative and additive. Okay? When we come to faith, he says, add to your faith virtue. Virtue means living a life that God is well pleased with. Okay? Meaning we're going to surrender to him and let our life reflect him as much as we can possibly do. Then, having added virtue, saying, I want to live a life that is pleasing to God, we add knowledge. He's given us his word. He's given us scripture. And so we are going to continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God's word. We grow in that truth. We study it. We pour over it. We pray that the Lord will guide us and lead us and build knowledge into our life. Only from that sense of first having virtue, then having knowledge, can we then have some self-control. We start to say, okay, I'm going to make choices that will limit my flesh and surrender to God's spirit in my life. And then having that, I'm going to say, I'm going to keep persevering. It's not going to be easy. The world is going to keep trying to pull me back, but I'm going to persevere in virtue, in knowledge, in my self-control. I'm going to keep persevering. And that will reflect in my life a greater sense of godliness. Not godlike, but godliness, a life that is more and more like Christ. We call it sanctification. And from that deep well of a life well lived, we can then show brotherly kindness in the world. Okay. Hopefully first in the church, that we can all be brotherly and kind to one another in the church, but ho hopefully also out in the world itself. And finally, that should produce that exceptional, unique kind of love that the Bible talks about. The unconditional love where you want the very best and you're only interested in what is good for another person not interested in how it affects you when you express love to them. You're not looking for reciprocity. You're looking to give it out. All these things can build up. That's why we hung that banner on that side. Okay. So, God's word is the only standard upon which a proper worldview can be built. Okay. It's the only way. And most of us who haven't looked at worldview, we've talked about it several times. If you've been here, great. This won't necessarily be a review, but we are talking about worldview. The most simplest way I can explain a worldview is it's the glasses upon which you see everything. You interpret all outside information. Okay? You're looking at it and saying, oh, this, oh, that, oh, this, oh, that. If you have a biblical, if I have a biblical worldview, it means the scripture defines how I see that, how I interpret that. If I don't have scripture as a foundation, it's guaranteed I'm going to look at that worldview from a different perspective. In fact, it's always going to be a man's perspective, not God's perspective, if it's not built on a biblical worldview. So the secular worldview leads to chaos and confusion and terror and violence. We just prayed for Israel. Does the, does the conflict in the Middle East stem from a biblical worldview or a secular worldview? Right? Do chaos in the world, do terror and violence and all these things that happen in the world, do they come from a biblical worldview? People showing that they have added virtue and knowledge and self-control and perseverance, all these things, to their life? Or is it, is it all the chaos we see in the world because people are rejecting God's truth? They're not looking at the world from a biblical perspective. They don't have a biblical worldview every single time. Well, from this point on, I've got a lot of graphics I'm going to show you. Um, and I'm going to do this in this way. So here's a book from Answers in Genesis from Ken Ham. Okay. And one of the, if you, this is not, not that hard to read, but if you buy this book... You can turn to the first couple of pages here, and it will give you a web link that tells you how to get the graphics I'm going to show you. And um, the reason I say that is because they, every time I see the graphics, they're just amazing, the, the quality here. So way beyond anything I could ever produce. Let's talk about this from a worldview perspective. Okay, so everything has the 
copyright. I'm in full compliance with their copyright use policy here. Okay. So when we look at situations in the world, okay, any of these things that are going on in the world, gay marriage, euthanasia, abortion, pedophilia, racism, gender issues, they all are symptoms of a secular worldview. Every single one of them is a symptom of a secular worldview. Okay. We will talk about this as we unfold this, but the problem is we look at something, what, pick your topic, whatever it may be, gender issues or abortion or whatever it may be, we want to attack that instead of dealing with the root problem, the ground level issue of the worldview issue that we see. Okay. And so another graphic that kind of presents the same thing is that all of these issues cause waves of confusion and people get tossed about by every wind and changing doctrine that comes from the mind of man or the heart of Satan rather than the word of God. In fact, Paul writing in Ephesians says that very thing. Ephesians 4 Verse 14, we root and ground ourselves in the truth of God's word so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. You see the difference? It's man's craftiness and his cunningness that's creating all of this confusion. Whereas if we stand firm on the truth of God's word, we will not be in that storm because all of those symptoms of a worldview problem or crisis will certainly not affect us. So in order to have this, we have a solid and reliable foundation. It, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? If you're going to build a building, you've got to have a solid foundation. What's the point of building a building without a solid foundation? You've got to start with a sound foundation. So in our lives, in our walk, in our worldview, we have to have a solid foundation. That means... As I said, we build our entire thinking on God's word in every area of life. If it contradicts scripture, it can't possibly be true. If it is affirmed by or scripture is neutral, then we have a whole different conversation. But if it's in direct conflict with scripture, then we know that scripture can't be false. Because Jesus said God's word is true. The psalmist said the entirety of his word is true. So we can't have that. We have to build every area of our life on the thinking of God's world, God's word, which builds our worldview. And ultimately, as Ken Ham will say many, many, many times in his talks, there are ultimately only two religions in this world. There's two religions in this world. And they fall down or they descend into either God's word or man's word. In fact, there's only one book on the planet that actually really claims to be authored by God. You can talk about, you know, things in Mormonism or in Islam or various other things, and there's just writings, and they're called holy, but to actually claim that it's God's word is unique to Scripture. But it also proves that it is God's word in so many ways. So we need to build our foundation on God's worldview, our worldview on God's word. Man's word, shifting sands, creating all kinds of symptomatic problems. God's word is the foundation. Now we can build a worldview that's actually valid and usable. The problem is the church over the last, well, actually probably the entire 2,000 years of its history, but certainly in the last 150 years with theories like evolution and whatnot, we begin to build a Christian worldview on a man's word philosophy, and guess what? It doesn't take long before that worldview collapses and crumbles because it's built on the wrong foundation. A biblical worldview provides rational responses to false claims in a secular worldview. How many, I mean, Ken has done this so many times I can't even count, but goes through, and how many times have you heard claims like this? Don't we live in a scientific age? meaning the Bible can't be true because science says it's not? Hasn't science disproved the Bible? How do you know the Bible is true? What evidence is there for God? Who made God? You believe in Adam and Eve, then where did Cain get his wife? How did all the races come about? And you know, how if there are only two people can we possibly have all these different races? Where's the evidence for the global flood? Do fossil layers prove millions of years in evolution? Okay. 
We know that man evolved from ape-like creatures. We know, put that in quotation marks. Okay? And uh, so how could the story of Adam and Eve be true? How can you believe in a loving God with all the death suffering we see in the world? Okay? Don't dinos- didn't dinosaurs live millions of years ago and evolve into birds? How could Noah fit all the animals on the ark? Hasn't science proved the, that evolution is true? Isn't the Bible an outdated book of mythology? Every single, how many have heard those kind of things, first off? Yeah. As an objection, every single one of those, there's a real, legitimate, verifiable answer that is better than the secular view in every case. Let me just talk about a few. Can't possibly cover everything. But if you go to Kentucky, you go to the Ark Encounter, okay? You will see this on the first deck of the Ark Encounter. There's a full layout, full scale. They actually have a full-size model that you actually walk in, spend hours in, okay, walking around it. They have this other model here, and it'll show you that they have, through their studies, what they call baromenology, the study of biblical kinds, they came up with 1,398 animal kinds that would have been on the Ark. That's not so many, is it? And that translates, you know, two by two and seven of the clean and all that. That translates to 6,744 total animals on the ark. With food, with provisions, with water, and the eight people, no problem. That's a perfect fit to fit all of those animals on the ark. What about that question, where's the evidence of a global flood? Well, have you been to Arizona? Have you seen the Grand Canyon? Have you seen pancaked layers of sedimentary deposits on top of each other, on top of each other, with no evidence of erosion between any of the layers all the way down? And these sedimentary layers roll not just across the entire continent, they go across the whole globe. You can see these sedimentary layers across the entire globe. Okay? Now, yes, of course, there's going to be a secular explanation, but there's also a biblical explanation. Because the secular explanation is, a small amount of water over a huge amount of time created everything you see here. A biblical explanation is a huge incomprehensible amount of water over a fairly short period of time created everything you see here. You see how you can talk in biblical terms? And it's actually a better answer because these layers are so knife edge they don't have any time gap in between them as the at least creation, uh, you know, PhD geologists look at these things. How about how we got all the people, okay? Well, we started with Adam and Eve, and we can go through all kinds of conversations a different day, but they were probably a nice middle brown complexion, and they had sons and daughters, according to Genesis 4, who obviously married within their own brother and sisterhood, and then you get to Genesis 1656 years later, Genesis 9 with the flood, and you get Noah and his three sons and their four wives, and you get all the people you know, over there at the Tower of Babel. So here's what they might look like with you know, some conceptions based on certain descriptions and who their population groups are. You and I can draw our entire genealogy back to these three men. It's been proven. Okay. So they all have different kinds of shades of color. And then you get to the Tower of Babel, and you get all the people here at the Tower of Babel, and then they spread out through the world. So do we have one race, as the Bible says, or do we have many races, as the, as the secular worldview says? We have one race, and every one of these skin tones, biologically, is easily explainable by having a middle brown original pair, original human beings, Adam and Eve couple. All of it, all these distinctives can come out of that. So I can't cover a whole lot else, but when we look at any topic, whether it's biology and all the species and all the variation of the species, or whether it's anthropology, the specific study of man, or geology, or biochemistry, or add in every other topic that you can think of, they all can be shown to confirm exactly what we already know to be true. God's word is true, just what Paul said to the Thessalonians. God's word, not from man, but from God himself. So in the sea of all of the stuff that we deal with, in our current culture here in 2024, we have an anchor that we can hold on to the truth and authority of God's word in the midst of every storm. The world wants to corrupt us. The world wants to conform us. The world wants to look at us to look at it through its lenses of secularism. We can hold firm to God's word as an anchor for our soul And we can have no reason to have an apology or an excuse for saying, but I believe God's word is true. I believe God's word has a better answer than what you're presenting to me. 
that allows us to then build a rock-solid, unchanging worldview, God's Word. We can talk about race. We can talk about marriage. We can talk about gender. We can talk about abortion. The secular worldview is built on sand. It's always changing. And so they're always changing how you're supposed to respond and react and interpret all of these topics, aren't they? What, if you say race today, racism in today versus racism in the 60s, it's a whole different definition, isn't it? All of these things keep changing because man keeps changing his approach and he's not dealing with a foundation upon which to see the world or interpret the world and the evidence around us. But unfortunately, here's some bad news. Unfortunately, those with a secular worldview are better at attacking the real target than believers. It's actually a foundational issue. Why do we say that? Well, let's look at these graphics too. Okay. So in this castle description, you got secularism built on sand and secular worldview. Here's God's word built, or God's a biblical worldview built on God's word and all these things. Let me walk through a whole bunch of slides that kind of point this out. Okay. When we look at the Christian worldview, I think Answers in Genesis is, is absolutely correct when they say they've separated the biblical worldview into the first 11 chapters of Genesis and then everything from Genesis 12 on to Revelation. In terms of it, it's a foundation, but the f initial foundation begins in Genesis 1 to 11. And what does the secular worldview do? They attack the foundation. You believe in a global flood? You believe Adam and Eve were the only original parents? You believe God created the world in six days? You believe this entire world and universe that we live in is about 6,000 years old? They attack it, they attack it, they attack it, they attack it. And what has the church done in response to those attacks? They've abandoned scripture and said, well, it doesn't matter if the world is 14 billion years old or 6,000 years old. And they begin to allow the foundation to be attacked. And guess what happens when the secularists begin to attack the foundations? The castle, the, our ability to stand firm on things like a Christian definition of marriage or the sanctity of life in the womb or that we all are one race, different skin tones, but one race. Our Christian worldview quickly begins to find its vulnerabilities and things begin to fall apart. Eventually, the whole Christian worldview just falls apart. This is what's happening in the church today. This is a great picture of what's happening in the church today. We have people compromising on the truth and authority of God's word, and then eventually just backing themselves out of Christianity altogether. And there's nothing left. Okay? And the secular worldview, even though it's built on shifting sands, it's just a sandcastle, it's, gonna, it, it's surviving because of the attack methodology to attack the foundation. So if we're going to actually be able to withstand the schemes and the wickedness of the devil and the attacks of the world, or we're going to actually live a life that is, like Paul would say, thank worthy to God because I see that you are heaven bound, we've got to build our thinking and our interpretation on God's word as the absolute foundation. And that begins with not compromising on things like the global flood or on creation or any of these things. Because as soon as we surrender it, we know that collapse is not far away. It really isn't. Okay. So then we build our Christian worldview castle on top of that. Then we can actually show evidence why we believe these topics are real, because we believe that God created everything. He made man in his own image. Therefore, the sanctity of life is incredibly important. God created marriage in Genesis chapter 2. It's incredibly important. We recognize that they represent the entirety of the human race. It's incredibly important. Okay. So we, as Christians and believers, if we're going to engage in a battle at all, shouldn't we learn from the tactics of our enemy and attack the foundation of a faulty worldview? We need to attack their foundation. We need to get their house crumbling because it can't possibly stand under the weight of man's faulty wisdom, right? We need to attack here. But what do we do? We send lobs and we go, oh, we're going to stand up for the right to life and abortion and all that, never dealing with the root cause issue, never dealing with the gay marriage or, or gay anything issues, okay, or racism, all the other topics out there. We're trying to attack it at the symptom level, 
while they're trying to attack us at the foundation level, they're being far more effective than the Christian church is in dealing with the right way to view and interpret those topics. So if you like those beautiful graphics, I'll once again point you to that book, and entirely answers in Genesis. There's very, very, very few organizations that I will proudly say I align with incredibly well with their statement of belief and faith. They do it incredibly well. I encourage you to do that. Check out any of the books or the resources that they have. I'll stop the marketing after that, but just said because they gave me the opportunity to use their graphics, I'm going to support them in that way. We did have Martin Niles in here in October from Answers in Genesis. He came. He's now the executive CEO of, the, um, of Answers in Genesis, so we had that honor and privilege to have him here not that long ago. So let's close with this. Based on recognizing that Paul and the Spirit of God and Jesus and all of Scripture says we're supposed to believe God's Word is from God, therefore it is true, how then shall we live? Okay. Well, the first step in the order here is faith in Jesus Christ. Everything I've just told you, if you really don't have faith in Christ, it's probably not going to fall into a receptive heart or upon receptive ears. Like, ah, I still have a secular worldview. Well, you've got to get to Christ first. Remember he said, add to faith, remember that whole list over here, add to faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, right? We've got to have that thing, we've got to have those components built on faith. If we're trying to build virtue without Christ, it's not really virtuous. If we're trying to build knowledge and it's not on Christ, it's not going to be the right kind of knowledge. We've got to have faith in Jesus Christ first. You can witness, you can evangelize, you can engage in apologetics, but you've got to talk about faith issues before you can talk about science issues or mathematic issues or any other kind of worldview issues and symptoms and problems. Faith in Jesus Christ. So I encourage every single one of us to be a person of faith in Jesus Christ. Really evaluate that today. Really make sure we are a people of faith in Christ because he's the one Savior that God has sent to us to give us eternal life and to give us a place in heaven. Pray for wisdom and repent of holding on to any unbiblical worldviews or viewpoints. I mean, just evaluate yourself. Has anything that I've said to you rustled any feathers with you? Made things, you know, a little uncomfortable? I'm not willing to surrender that. Well, pray about it. God, what would you have me to do? How would you have me to view this topic that I've sort of isolated and said, I don't want to surrender that to you? So if you're in faith, ask yourself, is there something you're holding on to tightly that God would have you to rethink? By placing trust in the source of all truth, God through his perfect word. That's where we have to have it. First in Christ, and then in the veracity and authority of scripture, which is true from Genesis to Revelation. Then study these scriptures to be equipped by the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do this alone. There's plenty of resources, but the greatest resource of all is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, if we pray and ask him for wisdom and understanding, he will guide us himself into an answer, or he might guide us to a resource, a pastor, an elder, a website, who can actually deal with these issues and challenges you have in a way that I think will absolutely give honor to God and will give comfort to your heart because you begin to realize it's actually true. Build all of our thinking on our biblical worldview. Look for areas where, you're, where you or I are not thinking like a biblical worldview adherent and begin to surrender those things once again to God. And then once you've accomplished that, teach others to do likewise. I'm not asking everybody to be a, a preacher, a, a pastor, or a Bible, you know, a, a Bible study leader or anything else, but you have influence over other people's lives. If you have been given or granted the grace of mastering some worldview problem you used to have and you've come through it, share it with somebody you know who's also struggling with it. Well, this is how God showed me the right way to think about this topic. Begin to be, be willing to be used by God as a teacher in some capacity to teach others to have a biblical worldview. These are so important. Notice how Paul was so grateful 
to our Thessalonian church 2,000 years ago because they, what, what did he say? He didn't say, because I presented the truth to you and you thought about it. He says, I presented the truth to you and you received it as it is the actual word of God. It's God's word. It's our responsibility to accept it or we will, I promise you, pay the consequences of not holding on to the biblical worldview, whether in this life or because it somehow corrupted us or robbed us of rewards that God has for us in heaven in some capacity. There's going to be some kind of consequence if we're not willing to purge out the secularism of our lives and receive it and replace it with a biblical worldview. I think all of us should be challenged by this. Let's pray. Father God, we love everything that you revealed to us in your word. None of us, Lord God, with 40 lifetimes could ever master your word, but we can certainly learn from it. We can certainly surrender to its truth claims, Lord God. We can certainly look at it and say, this has the words of life. Where else could we go but to Jesus and to the word that you've given us as truth, Lord. I pray that each one of us here, Lord God, would truly allow you to examine our hearts and reveal to our minds and our spirits, Lord God, where you would have us to change our thinking, change our approach, change our behaviors, Lord God, and that we'd actually surrender to those things and walk worthy of the calling which you called us with, Lord God. I pray that that desire would build up in us in such a way that we would be heaven-bound believers worthy of thanks and celebration by those who are watching us walk into that glorious light that you have provided for us in heaven. We thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that brings us into that glory. And I pray that our faith would be rooted and grounded in you without wavering or compromise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have prayer teams up front. Love to have you come up and take advantage of any prayer. We do have our new members information class, so you don't have to become a member if you come back and get lunch. But if you want to know a little bit more about us, what we believe, or how we can answer questions, be glad to have you there. So it starts in about half an hour. There are food and child care for that as well.